Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Lisa Gardner. Lisa is a number one New York Times bestselling writer. She is the author of more than 20 suspense novels published in more than 30 countries. Lisa's latest novel is One Step Too Far. Lisa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. It's great to have you here. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your new novel, One Step Too Far, how would you describe the novel? Oh, so it was fun for me when I was writing it. I had this kind of overall kind of vision. It's Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None Goes for a Hike. <laughs> Basically, eight people go into the woods, eight people do not come back out. <laughs> That's great. Well, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write One Step Too Far? Sure. Most of my books have something to go on, uh, inspired by the real world. So I'm an avid hiker where I live. I'm in the mountains of New Hampshire. And I writ, wrote, a, you know, two years ago, this book for Frankie Elkin, where she is working on kind of the missing urban that falls through the cracks. A uh, Haitian teenager in Boston been gone 11 months no one's even looking for her i think that's a scenario most of us kind of get from headlines and we should be aware of but then i end up reading an article that was totally news to me which is the number of people that go missing in national public lands basically our mountains our wilderness i mean 1600 people and one of the things that's intriguing about it is it, there is no real jurisdiction or, or, or ongoing responsibility. Missing persons in the woods, a young kid wandering away from a campfire, a young man go, disappearing on a hiking weekend, it becomes volunteers. And don't get me wrong, they're fabulous volunteers. I mean, thousands of people will show up. You will get pilots volunteering their time to, you know, fly over the mountains with infrared, you'll get dog search teams, you will get the National Guard, you'll get all this time and time and attention. But it's all volunteer. They have to go home eventually. So three to six weeks out kind of becomes it. And if you're the family and it's still your loved one who has not been found, what do you do? And reading about this, I was like, okay, Frankie Elkin, this is her thing. She tries to find the missing persons the rest of the world's no longer looking for. This is what she would do. So she's in Wyoming. She reads a case. Young man's disappeared on a bachelor party weekend. It's the father's last ditch attempt with a couple of basically friends and a guide and a Bigfoot hunter and a search dog expert that we can't bring him home now. We never will. And she's like, I'm in. I don't hike, I don't camp, I don't know anything at all about the wilderness, but what the hell, I mean, <laughs> and we're off and running from there. <laughs> That's great. Well, well, as I said, One Step Too Far is your latest novel and you're a best-selling writer, but I wonder if you could tell us about your original writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published. Well, this is fun for me. I have been a novelist now for 30 years. I'm a bit, I would even argue, a dinosaur in this industry. So I started out in... Oh my gosh, like the, the early 1990s. <laughs> we didn't even have the internet. Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, and there was no masters of fine art programs. There was just, you read. And, and if you wanted to write, you tried to write. And then you read some more and you wrote some more. And you kind of felt your way through experientially learning as you went. So I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I ended up with a novel. And then I, I was in Oregon. I'd never met an agent, an editor. I knew nothing about publishing, but this is what dates me. There was a book in the library. Nowadays, my own daughter would be like, and I then Googled, but that would be in the library. <laughs> and it had instructions, how to publish a novel. <laughs> and I followed them, which sounds great, but I will be honest, it took many, many years. And in the end, I got a publisher to read a manuscript and they agreed and I've kind of been off and running ever since, but I'll be the first to say I was a published author for 10 years before I was overnight success. And you talk to other authors, that's about right. 
<laughs> well, well, what what led you to that overnight success? Because I know that you started writing romances, but then you switched to suspense. What was what was that kind of um, decision for you to to move to thrillers? Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I'm a commercial fiction author. My goal when you enjoy when you read One Step Too Far is it's a page turner and you step way too late and you abandon your children, your job, your commute. I think that's all very good. And you may learn something along the way, but my job is to entertain. And so part of that is then what is entertaining to people. So 10 years in, I got a new agent and I was like, I want to be a full-time author. And back in this day and age, it's like 20 years ago, she's like, well, then you need to write a serial killer book. <laughs> and I don't know police procedures, and I'm very fortunate to say I've never met a serial killer. So I decided to write from the perspective of a wife who figures out her husband is the serial killer everyone's looking for. And that became the perfect husband, and that became the overnight success. I somewhat stumbled into a happy hybrid of domestic suspense. You know, the mm -hmm. person you should fear is the person you look love the most but also this totally serial killer vibe and that's you know that's kind of the sweet spot you want to stumble full to the things <laughs> people are very interested in that resonates with them and i think it's there's a this very classic element of people worrying about the people they know the best but do they right well, well, as I mentioned at the at the beginning, and as you've discussed, I mean, you're you're uh, a best selling writer at this point, new, number one best selling New York Times author. I'm curious when you sit down at this point, and you've been doing this for for many years, as you mentioned. But when you sit down at this point to write a new novel, is there pressure there um, that you put on yourself, or that you think about, you know, in terms of the people who are waiting to read what you're writing next, meaning, you know, your, your, your publishing team, your agent, your author, how do you deal with that? Or does it not even phase you at this point? Well, this is what I would say. Part of being, all of us become writers because we're readers. I'm still a reader. I mean, I've been a novelist now, published novelist for 30 years, but I still read all the time. I'm excited for new authors, new voices. I have my favorite authors. I have my also buys, everything. And I think at the end of the day, every time I sit down to write, my goal is to write something I would want to read. And I mean, one, that's kind of pressure enough, mm -hmm. but I think that's also the best guidelines. You're looking for that story that's page turning. I can't go to bed anymore. Or I just missed my subway stop, but it's okay because I got to read one more chapter. <laughs> but the character matters. And, you know, the plot kind of sticks with you a little. Like maybe I learned something, you know, along the way. Those are kind of all those elements together. But I get them by reading other books and continuing to strive and seek. I, I want to be as good as these people. Hey, this is Jeff, the host of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Thanks again for listening to the podcast. I have a company that I want to tell you about that I think you will definitely be interested in as a podcast listener. Family Sounds. Have you ever gone to a family reunion and traded stories and laughed with your relatives? And later you thought, gosh, I wish there was some way that we had a way to preserve those stories and preserve those memories. Um, when we're not face-to-face. -face. Well, now you do with Family Sounds. Family Sounds can create an hour-long podcast that's just for you, that's just for your family, that tells the stories of your family and your relatives. And Family Sounds team, they're pros. They've done this before. They have lots of experience crafting stories for public broadcasting through radio and podcasts. They will use your family's voices as well as a professional narrator to tie the story together. Again, the name of the company is Family Sounds, and you can find them at family-sounds.com forward slash books. Again, that is family-sounds.com 
forward slash books. Family Sounds, your memories, your family in a podcast today. So check them out, family-sounds.com forward slash books. Thanks for listening. Are you on a search for a special holiday, a birthday gift for a reader in your life? A reader who loves history? Well, I've got a suggestion for you. How about giving them weekly historic letters in the mail from Letter Joy? Every week, they'll receive a letter from a famous historical figure or an eloquent eyewitness to a major event. Past Letter Joy letters have included famous defense attorneys, the United States and China, or working on the railroad, exploring the American history of the railroads. For example, one letter was an engineer writing home to his wife to describe the tough process of laying tracks for the Transcontinental Railroad. Every letter joy letter arrives at your door on fine stationery or parchment with a real stamp. And each letter also includes the postscript an article by expert curators on the latest letter and the historical figures and events connected to it. Visit letterjoy.co to give weekly historic letters to the historian in your life. And I have a special offer for listeners of this podcast. Use promo code BOOKS at checkout to get $5 towards your first order. Again, That's letterjoy.co, promo code books, to give a special gift to the reader in your life. That's great. Well, I'm curious about your writing process. You talked earlier about the idea and the articles that you read about um, people going missing in national parks and national um, forests. Once you had that idea, do you sit down and and write an extensive outline or do you just have kind of the initial idea and just dive into the narrative? What's your process? So I am not a plotter. I was at the beginning of my career because I felt like I needed the security of knowing what was going to happen next. But at this point in my profession, I'm more like setting the stage and then feeling out what will happen next. So in the case of One Step Too Far, it's okay. Something, I read an article, you know, all these people that go missing in national public lands and no one's even looking for them anymore. And then two, oh, I'm an avid hiker. I spent a lot of time in the mountains. And as part of that, during the pandemic, when my hiking partners and I started doing much more remote, Mm -hmm. hardcore hikes, we took a survival class which involved, frankly, fire and knives. And if you're a suspense (laughs) novelist, anything that involves fire and knives is going to become a bit. (laughs) It's like like these ingredients go into the hopper. (laughs) And I love dogs. I love search and rescue dogs and cadaver dogs. And there's, in my backyard, a team that deals with dogs. And I was like, I have to write a book that has dogs. (laughs) And then I start reading about the best people who have statistics on the missing nationwide are Bigfoot hunters. And how crazy is that? I mean, that's a real life thing. And it's like, well, now I have to have a real life. I have to have a Bigfoot hunter. So it's like, <laughs> again, it's like ingredients go in. And, you know, you do some research. Okay, what are the best search practices? How do you get permission to go in the woods? What does survival look like? Or camping? Or like you, when you start getting off the grid in Wyoming, what does Wyoming look like? And then it's, it, it's a little stressful. I will tell you the truth. I show up each day and wait to see what will happen next. But I feel like ultimately what I'm looking for as a writer and a reader Mm -hmm. is that the characters are driving the story. Who they are, the decisions they make, kind of implicitly gives you conflict and keeps you going forward. That's great. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are starting to write their own stories and novels for publication? Well, definitely read a lot and continue reading. When I run into published authors like, well, I don't read anymore. I can't read when I'm writing. I'm like, you're a professional. Aren't you writing all the time? Does that mean you're not reading at all? I mean, 
th- there's new voices, there's new inspiration everywhere. So read. And then I, I'm a believer that writing is kind of falls under that 10,000 hours. Y- you got to just do it. And a lot of it you're going to throw away. I only wish I was paid by the word. I mean, the amount of pages that go into any project, then at a certain point, I'm like, ooh. I mean, to me, novel writing is almost like a decision tree. And because I don't plot, I'm making each decision on the fly. And they're definitely every single novel. And it's been a lot of books now. It's been like, oh, I should have forked right there, not left. So because I did fork left, all of that must disappear. I'm just going to throw it away. There's no point and go back and make the right turn so being it's messy there's writing is messy and that's okay anyone who gets up in the morning and tells you i know what i'm doing i love what i wrote this is awesome is probably lying that's at least i taught myself that so i can feel better about my chalk (laughs) (laughs) so are you working on a new novel now I am working on figuring out what I want to do next, which is the fun phase of taking in ideas and inspiration, reading a lot, reading a lot of true crime, reading a lot of real life stuff, getting out in the universe. And um, I, uh, I had a fun, fun chat with Lee Child last year. Where it was like, everyone wants to ask us where we get book ideas. And the truth of it is, Book ideas are everywhere. How do you not have a book idea? <laughs> and I'm in that phase. I agree with him. I have book ideas everywhere. Try to pick which one is the best bright and sparkly object. <laughs> That's great. Well, you've talked about reading a lot. What novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh, yeah. So there's several. Um, I just finished at like two this morning. So I'm a little, you know novel drunk and sleep deprived but not happy (laughs) happy sort of way um s.a cosby who's a newer author to me it's only his second book razor blade tears he and i get to talk next week it's part of book tour and he has had so much buzz for his southern novels very authentic dialogue very gritty um razor blade tears kind of just i don't know it's one of those books that blows you away it's such an authentic capturing of people, place, and tension. I mean, it's two fathers who have both been discriminated against in their lives, and yet also, and they're aware of this, discriminated against their gay sons. And then their gay sons were murdered. And and, and, and that wonderful juxtaposition of, um, I feel like I've been downtrodden my whole life, and now there's this wonderful line in the book where one of the fathers says, is it wrong that I mourn my son so strongly when I loved him so weakly? And, mm. and, and that ability, that ability to put you in this world of people that they're not your world, they're not who you would hang out with, but that sentiment, you get a lot. I mean, what does it mean when you only realize what you had when it's gone? And in their minds, being how they are, they're ex-cons, the only way to justify this is revenge. While at the same time, they're like, we didn't stand up for them at all when they were alive. But we are dedicated to avenging them when they're dead. When we get, that's a little twisted. (laughs) That's not the best thing. (laughs) But it's how we're wired. We want it to be our sons. We wish we were open. We wish, and I like characters like that. I think of Frankie Elkin and One Step Too Far. There's both who she is and who she aspires to be. And I think that for readers, we all relate to that. There's also who we are. We are a product of our environment. We are a product of our families. But it doesn't mean we don't aspire to be something different. And it's that juxtaposition or that balancing act of who you are and who you want to be that drives a lot of conflict in novels. That's great. Well, I, I was just going to mention that I did interview S.A. Cosby on the, on the podcast. Oh, nice. So someone, someone can go back and listen to it. So um, great. Well, again, we've been speaking with bestselling writer Lisa Gardner. Her new novel is One Step Too Far. The novel is on sale now. So go buy a copy at your local independent bookstore. And Lisa, thanks for doing this interview. I hope readers really enjoy it and appreciate Frankie's 
journey into the wild, which is not at all her comfort zone. But if she doesn't figure out and figure out the humans involved, um, the wilderness may just come back to get her. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Thank you so much, Jeff.